Sorry, were you talking to me? I said you've grown so young. Uh, 1969. <laughs> I was young. Clay Coup, Vietnam. Wow. I was eight then, Paul. And it's a great picture. With a, with a Nikon. Yeah, is that a Nikon film. or is that a Nikon? Nikon, yeah. Nikon F. I bought it from a news photographer in Washington, D.C. Wow. Hmm. All right. Well, it's like I have good news to share. You do? Well, tell us. My youngest son um, made it on to the OPP this week. That's a big feat. On to the, I missed it. Uh, my. The Ontario Provincial Police, police Tactical Tactical Unit. Oh, nice. Oh. Ooh, congrats. Congratulations. Outstanding. Proud. Yeah. Congratulations. I have to turn off notifications because it's sitting there disturbing me. Not letting me turn. Here we go. All I have to do is quiet my dog. Good luck with the dog. The mute button for the dog is located. <laughs> so, um, we, our program tonight is uh, cybersecurity, and uh, Jim has been uh, working in this field for quite a while. So he's going to share some wisdom with us. And so. <laughs> Have any, any questions relating to cybersecurity? You might kind of be thinking about them as Jim presents his uh, thing here, and I'll just take it away, Jim. Okay, well, um, it was supposed somebody need. Can you mute everybody? And you see the birth page and him. That's better. Can you still hear me? Okay. All right. Well, I got good news and bad news and then some more good news and then some bad news. So um, the good news is I showed up. Um, I'm going to talk about cyber war tonight, but um, Elizabeth was supposed to talk about fishing tonight, but she couldn't make it. She had to go and travel. And then since uh, it looks like I'll have a little extra time, I want to talk a little bit about the ride, okay? And uh, the other bad news is by the time I get done, you're probably going to be tired of listening to me, so. Um. Can you see those slides? Okay. All right. Um, this is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And the last, um, I don't know, three or four months, I've been spending all my time doing cyber hygiene. So I was hoping to find something a little different to talk about. I came across this article in Wired Magazine and provided a nice overview of um, cyber warfare. So I thought maybe I'd discuss this a little bit and um, maybe give you a little background on this. My experience is that the Chinese want our technology, but I don't think they necessarily want to start a cyber war with us. But I don't think you're going to have any trouble figuring out who our real adversary is by the end of the, the um, presentation. Alan, Andy Greenberg is a writer for Wired. Um, he covers 
security, privacy, information, freedom, and hacker culture. He's the author of this upcoming book, Sandworm, which is available for um, pre-order on Amazon. He's talking about the new era of cyber war and the hunt for cre the Kremlin's most dangerous hackers. I started out in the Navy as an electronic warfare technician during the Vietnam conflict. Um, electronic warfare is the use of the electromagnetic spectrum, radio frequency, um, directed energy to control the use of the spectrum by the enemy. We did electronic surveillance and then we had electronic countermeasures where we could send deceiving information to say a missile. Um, the problem was, is it might take us 10 minutes to find the adversary and you had a flight time of somewhere between two minutes and 30 seconds to react. So you didn't have much time. Now they've put on these, um, they call it the close in weapon system. It's a, a Gatling gun. So radar control Gatling gun. And if a missile is inbound, it can, um, it can destroy it pretty quickly. It sounds like a buzzsaw. Cyber warfare involves crippling the adversary's um, use of information systems in the internet. There's a lot of discussion going on in, within the military between electronic warfare and cyber warfare. Um, it's, it's almost become kind of a philosophical discussion, so. I don't really have an opinion on it. Um, I got work to do, so I don't have time to really discuss all that. But I just thought I'd give you a little background on the difference between electronic warfare and cyber warfare. The scope of the problem. Um, <clears throat> I went to a conference up at Fort Gordon, which is the um, center of Army, Army Cyber. And one of the panels provided a pretty interesting perspective on how big this vulnerability problem really is. Um, there are a total of about 70 million lines of code or software in Windows, Google, and Android. For every thousand, uh, thousand lines of code, there's an estimated 10 to 50 vulnerabilities. Since only about 122,000 vulnerabilities have been discovered so far, that leaves somewhere between 650,000 to 3.4 million more vulnerabilities to find. And this is really only the tip of the iceberg. You have other issues such as weak, weak passwords, people making mistakes, insider threats, poor physical security, and so on. The good news is, that the employment outlook in the cybersecurity field is excellent. In 1903, John Fleming was adjusting the apparatus in preparation for his and Marconi's demonstration of sending Morse code wirelessly over long distance for the first time in history. An untrained ear wouldn't have known what was happening, but Fleming knew what was occurring. Strong wireless pulses were interfering with the projector's electric arc discharge. It was immediately apparent that they were being trolled. So the first network-based trolling occurred 116 years ago by Neville Maskelin. If you have seen the movie Imitation Game, then you already know about the breaking of the Enigma code in 1939. One of the great heroes of the Second World War was René Carmilly, French Army General Comptroller. He is often credited as a first hacker for his work defying the Nazis by compromising the punch card IBM system that Nazis used in order to track down French Jews. Not only did he withhold this information from the Nazis, but he used his data mining powers 
to find thousands of ex-French soldiers who could be recruits for the French resistance. And data mining is just becoming another um, big buzzword within the community these days. So he did it, what, 60 years ago. AIDS, also known as, known as AIDS info disk or PC cyborg Trojan is a, is a uh, Trojan horse that replaces the autoexec.bat file. This would be used by aid to, AIDS to count the number of times the computer booted up. It would count up the number of boots and when it hit, once it hit 90, it would hide all your directories and it would charge you $189 to get your data back. As for the $10 million stolen, stolen in 1984 from Citibank by the Russians, Levin and his cohorts were all busted and did hard time. Bureau 121 is the North Korean Cyber Warfare Agents cre Agency created in 1998, which is part of the Reconnaissance General Bureau of North Korea's military. According to American authorities, the General Bureau of Reconnaissance, also termed Reconnaissance General Bureau, maintains clandestine operations and has six bureaus. Cyber operations are a cost-effective way for North Korea to maintain an asymmetric military option as well as a means to gather intelligence. Its primary intelligence targets are South Korea, Japan, and the United States. When the Estonian government decided in April 2007 to move a statue of a Russian soldier named the Liberative, Liberator of Tallinn from the center of the city, the move touched off massive pro protests by the government, by the country's Russian speaking minority. These riot, those riots were accompanied by a wave of crude distributed denial of service attacks that took down hundreds of West Estonian websites likely launched with the backing of the Russian government. Online services of Estonian banks, media outlets, and government bodies were taken down by unprecedented levels of internet traffic. Massive waves of spam were sent by botnets and huge, huge amounts of automated online requests were swamp, swamp servers. Results, the result for Estonian citizens was that cash machines and online banking service were sporadically out of action. Government employees were unable to communicate with each other on email news, and newspapers and broadcasters suddenly found that they couldn't deliver the news. This initial attack, this is really the first um, attack that's considered cyber warfare. This initial attack resulted in NATO establishing their NATO Cooperative, Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in 2008 in the city of Tallinn. It probably will not surprise you that the Russians deny any involvement in this attack. The next year, very similar cyber attacks were used during Russia's war in Georgia, bombarding the country's websites at the same time as, <coughs> excuse me, Russian tanks rolled towards its capital and Russian ships blockaded its coastline. As relatively crude as the online tax, attacks may have been, they were perhaps the first time that wide-scale digital attacks were combined with a physical invasion. On 20 July 2008, weeks before the Russian invasion, Zombie computers were already on the attack. The website of Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili was targeted, resulting in overloading the site. The site was taken down for 24 hours. On 5 August 2008, the website for OS Inform News Agency and OS Radio were hacked and, and continued. On 11 August, Georgia accused Russia of waging cyber warfare on the Georgian government website simultaneously with a military offensive. Again, the Russian government has denied any involvement.
Starting in 2009, an ingen ingenious piece of malware known as Stuxnet began to infiltrate the network of Iran's nuclear enrichment facility at Natanz, silently altering the settings of its fragile centrifuges to destroy them and sabotage the country's quest for nuclear weapons. Only when the worm accidentally spread to the rest of the world in 2010 was the operation revealed and two years later, alleged to be the work of NSA and Israeli intelligence. This is strongly suspected, but not confirmed. A study of the spread of Stuxnet by Symantec showed that the main affected countries in early days of the infection were Iran, Indonesia, and India. 58% of the infected computers were from Indonesia, 18.22% India, 8.3% Azerbaijan and 2.57 United States. Iran was reported to have beefed up its cyber war capabilities following the Stuxnet attack and has been suspected of conducting counterattacks against US banks. Saudi Aramco. Just two months later, a piece of malware known as Shamoon hit oil giant Saudi Aramco, destroying 35,000 computers. The attack, the largest of its kind ever seen at the time, was quickly tied to Iranian hackers and seen as a proxy attack against U.S. interests in retaliation for Stuxnet. Saudi Aramco said that it had put its networks back online Saturday, 10 days after a malware attack, floored to 30,000 workstations at the oil giant. A previously unknown group called Cutting Sword of Justice claimed responsibility for the attack. This, this affected three and four of the estimated 40,000 workstations used by the oil giant. The group said that it had hacked Saudi Aramco in retaliation against the Al Saud regime for crimes and atrocities taking place in various countries around the world, especially neighboring countries such as Syria, Bahrain, Yemen, Lebanon, and Egypt. In an interview with Major General Mansour of Turkey of the Saudi Interior Ministry said the attack came from an organized group on four different continents. Very little is known about the cutting sword of justice. I don't know who they are, but they are probably living a life of leisure and driving exotic cars. In late 2014, hackers calling themselves the Guardians of Peace ripped through the network of Sony Pictures Stolen leaked vast amounts of data, including unreleased films, destroyed thousands of computers, and demanded that Sony not release its Kim Jong-un assassination comedy, The Interview. Though the hackers at first seemed to be cyber criminals demanding a ransom, the FBI soon revealed that they were in fact North Korean state-sponsored hackers. The hackers involved claimed to have taken more than 100 terabytes of data from Sony but that claim has never been confirmed. The attack was conducted using malware. Components of the attack included a listening implant, a backdoor, a proxy tool, destructive hard drive tool, and destructive target cleaning tool. The components clearly suggest an intent to gain repeated entry, extract information, and be destructive, as well, remove, as, well as remove evidence of the attack. U.S. government officials stated on December 17, 2014, their belief that the US, North Korean government was centrally involved in the hacking, although there was some initially some debate within the White House whether or not to make this finding public. Two days before Christmas in 2015, Russian hackers triggered the first ever blackout induced by a cyber attack, turning off the power to hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. Most effective were consumers of Ukrainian power. I can't, I can't pronounce that. 
servicing 30 substations which were switched off. And about 230,000 people were left without electricity for a period of one to six hours. At the same time, consumers of two other energy distribution companies, another Ukrainian power company, and a third Ukrainian power company were also affected by a cyber attack, but on a smaller scale. The attack came in the midst of Russians, Russia's physical invasion of the country's eastern region and Crimean principle, peninsula. It was both preceded and followed by severe series of data destroy, destroying attacks, culminating in another blackout targeting the country's capital in late 2016. The attack is attributed, attributed to a Russian advanced persistent threat group known as Sandworm, and attacks were conducted from computers with IP addresses allocated to the Russian Federation. Not Petya, June 2017. Russia's cyber war against Ukraine climaxed in June of 2017 when it released the NotPetya malware, seeding the data's destroying worm onto thousands of machines via the hacked hijacked software updates, updates of the Ukrainian accounting software MEDOC. But not as not as but as NotPetya devastated Ukrainian networks, it also um, spread to multinationals like Merck's, Merck, FedEx, and many others, causing a record-breaking $10 billion in damages. The malware dubbed not Petya because it masquerades as a Petya ransomware exploded across the world, taking out businesses from shipping ports and supermarkets to ad agencies and law firms. Once inside a corporate network, this well-oiled destructive program worms its way from computer to computer, trashing the infected machine's file systems. Although it demanded about $300 in Bitcoin to unscramble the hostage data, the mechanisms put in place to collect the money from victims in exchange for decryption keys quickly disintegrated. Despite the slick programming, be Behind the fast-spreading malware, little effort or thought was put into protecting the loot. This masqueraded as a software update, which is wild, widely used in the computer, so when it was downloaded and installed by victims, it contaminated their network with NotPetya. If this software was running with domain admin access, it would immediately be game over. The GRU Military Intelligence Service of the Russian Federation created NotPetya, according to the CIA. Triton Trisis, August 2017. Just months after NotPetya, an oil refinery owned by Saudi Arabian firm Petro Rabai was shut down by a sophisticated piece of malware known as Triton or Trisis. But it could have been much worse. Analysts found that the mysterious malware, which showed traces of a Russian science institute's fingerprints, had been designed to turn off safety systems in the plant, potentially triggering a lethal accident. In a worst case scenario, the rogue code could have led to release of toxic hydrogen sulfide gas or caused explosions, putting lives at risk both at the facility and the surrounding area. FireEye later linked Triton Trisis with the Central Scientific Research Institute of Chemistry and Mechanics, a technical research organization owned by the Russian, Russian government. This table is from the business risk intelligence company Flashpoint and provides a useful overview. The lowest threat is jihadi hackers who are evaluated as tier two with negligible risk. Hacktivists and attention seekers are rated tier three for moderate impact. Iran, North Korea, and cyber criminals are rated as tier four with moderate to severe impact. 
China and Russia are rated as tier six, which is a top tier on par with the US, Canada, United Kingdom and Australia and New Zealand and may have potentially catastrophic impact. This is what I came up with um, for what we can expect to see in the next year or two. Nation states have the funds to develop a mature capability and have no obligation to share information about it. Malware is going to continue to be a wet wear of life. RAM based malware is almost impossible to find. You have polymorphic malware that changes itself to avoid detection. And you have mercenaries for hire that are probably already in use. Interference with the government, interference with the election will result in the government and political campaigns to disparage any information on the internet. Ransomware attackers have found the sweet spot for targets, mid-sized cities. Mid-sized cities don't have enough money for good security, but they have the money to pay several hundred thousand dollars ransom and they usually pay off. Finally, intellectual property theft is going to continue not only by companies, but by nation states. The Chinese in particular do not look at international inter intellectual property the same way we do. They have put multiple companies out of business by stealing design, building it cheaper, and selling it at a substantially lower price than the IP creator owner. I don't know if you've seen a picture of the, the um, Chinese space shuttle next to our space shuttle, but they're identical. On the bright side, if you're looking for job security, you may have found your new home. There may be as many as 2 million unfilled positions in cyber over the next few years. Here's some potential uh, jobs that you could get. It's a pretty interesting field. And now we're going to have a little quiz. Any ideas? The Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no politics. Canada, the Russians. Russia and China. The Russians, yeah, that's my call. Russians and the Chinese. Well, the Chinese want our, want our information, they want our technology. What about Romania? They found that cluster of uh, buildings where they have house, warehouse uh, servers that were attacking the US and doing all kinds of hacking. Oh yeah, they're all doing that stuff. It's just the, the two big ones are Russia and China. Those are the ones with a big capability, you know? And then there's Canada. Of course, Canada, of course. <laughs> yeah. All right. So do we have any questions? It's scary, I'll tell you that. Yeah, How most do... most people don't like to look at my briefs. Oh my How do we individually yeah. How do we well, individually best protect well, ourselves? Uh, I'm going to give you some. Can you see that? Can you see that? Questions. Yeah. Do you see the questions thing? Oh, you still see the questions? Okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, Jim, I use LastPass as an online passwords manager. Do you have advice about that and how we protect ourselves? Well, LastPass is supposed to be one of the good ones. They've had a couple of um, issues. I use OnePass. Um, Should we be using the Kaspersky um, virus protection and malware protection application? I, I, I personally wouldn't recommend uh, Kaspersky, but... Um, Kaspersky is the, mostly what is used. It's what? They've been using a lot of uh, Apple uh, applications, Macs. 
but it's a uh, Russian application. Yeah. That's the problem is, is the, the my bosses have, have um, removed that from all government computers. It's a little bit like how the FBI does not allow no, like Lenovo laptops inside. Oh yeah, we don't do Lenovo either. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have to be careful of what you buy. A lot of, it's a very difficult um, topic because a lot of components are made in China and Korea. So you don't, in a lot of cases, you don't know what you're getting. Um, even even the U.S. government tries to make sure that they buy computers from U.S. companies, but those are the components are manufactured overseas, and in a lot of cases they're they're assembled in Mexico. So it's really difficult to um, to know what you're really getting. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jim okay. Zoom, right. Go ahead. Jim rules. Jim's rules. Yes, Jim's rules of thumb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of problems with people getting phone calls. It, can, you, can you send that to to uh, to Linda that we can put it in the newsletter? Sure. That would be great. Um, people get phone calls. They um, they might pretend to be the sheriff's department, saying they have a bench warrant for you, or um, that you're in some other kind of trouble. But if you give them, give them a credit card number, you can pay the fine right now, and they won't arrest you. Well, if if you didn't make the call, don't ever give anybody any personal information. If they call you. You. The um, there was just yeah. a story last week about last week about um, the, the 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 ability to mimic voices. The ability to mimic voices. There there was a, a CEO yeah. of a company was, uh, that a supposedly CEO called company, the CFO. Told him to transfer two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and, to and as it turned out, somebody had just made up a voice call, and the CFO acted on it and actually transferred the money. So, hey voice, go ahead. Please mute. Voice. We're getting an echo. Can we mute people? Getting a hell of an echo. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to get some people muted. The echo is really bad. I thought it was just me. So you can't go on recognizing a person's voice because they're, they've gotten so good. So, same thing with with movies. You can't. It's easy to um, to modify a movie and make it very, look very realistic unless you're going to do some kind of forensic analysis. So they can they can make a, a video look uh, realistic. Um, probably one of the biggest problems we see is clicking on a link in an email. All you have to do is go, on to, go to the wrong web page and they can install software on your computer. Just one click. It's caused a lot of companies millions of dollars. Okay. Um, if, if it's not from a trusted source or you're not sure about the link, just don't click on it. It's not worth it. Okay, it's really not worth it. One of the things that you can do is to look at a link. And can you see this? Do you see the little window above there? No. It's too tiny to see it, Jim. That oh, link.com, yeah. right? Yeah, this one, the big one says good link. And the little one, if you hover over it, it shows you what the real link is. Bad link. And it says badlink.com. So um, what you can do is if this big one looks like a, um, a valid link, you can copy it or you can retype it. The problem is that they can fake a link 
uh, that looks legitimate and isn't. I got a series of emails from New York State uh, suggesting that I needed to update my information for uh, voting outside of state. And it said, click on this link and enter your name, your address, your birthday, your social security number, and we'll update your data. And everything looked real, even the links looked real. But, you know, it might have been something dot something backslash something else, and it wasn't the real New York State gov website. They're, ver they're very clever. I'll give you an example, too, of um, I use USAA for banking, and I got one the other day. It was from mailservice.usaa.com. Well, there's no way for a company to stop somebody from doing that. That's not against the law. So they can have a domain that looks the same, but it's not really. It's a different domain, and it's taken you to another website. And it's really pretty easy to copy a website. So when you go to their website, it looks just the same as a real website, if that makes sense. Yeah, I had that with my, you know, when I make the application for the Homeland Security, and there was a site that was exactly looking like the government site, but it was not the gov at the end. So, but if you don't know that, you are stepping in the inside this, you know? Yeah, so, you have yeah. Yeah, well, be very careful. Yes, what I did when we find out because I want money only for the application, you know, and then I sent them an email. I said, you know, I I'm not agree with that. I don't need that, and this is not a, a legal process. And if they still want the money from me, I will go for the court. I don't care. And then they gave me free, you know, but I was scared about my, my personal information for sure. But if you have no clue in Germany, it's not allowed to do that. In Germany, it's really when your website looks like an official website, they will, they will stop you. You cannot do that in Germany. Even, even if the Russians are very bad with the, you know, with the grandsons, uh, the grandchild things, this is also very uh, popular in German to call older people and get the money from them. But what I learned in America is if somebody from the government wants something from you, they send you a letter. They never call you. Right. They don't but call I you. Warn, don't I'll anything. warn you. I recently got a letter that looked absolutely legitimate, like it was from the IRS, mm -hmm. but it wasn't from the IRS. Really? A letter, a piece of paper, yep. So my recommendation, just to piggyback on Jimmy's, is go to the, I, the real IRS website, log into it there, or your USA website, log into the one you normally use, and then see if that organization is really trying to contact you and just ignore the letter, shred it, or uh, submit it as, as fraud. But uh, they're even mailing letters now that look legitimate. Interesting. So nobody, no legitimate organization is going to call you and ask for your credit card number or your private information. If you didn't dial the number, if you're not making a call, don't don't give them any information. Um, that that gets a lot of people. We had a guy here. He was 70 years old, and some some crooks had scammed him a couple of years ago. So they went in for a second dip, and they tried to convince him that he owed them seventy thousand dollars. They went so far as to have his car towed. They said they were confiscating his car. They changed all the locks, locks in his house. And when the local sheriff found the guy, he was at FedEx with a box with $70,000 cash getting ready to FedEx it to these crooks. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta be careful. There's, there's some, some um, unsavory people out there. Um, Another good one is if your grandson is in jail and they call and they need some bail money or they need some money to, to get home or something, you need to verify that situation. Are you telling me I'm not going to get that shipment of oil from Nigeria? <laughs> no, but I'm going to get the $12 million, million from the prince. Um, 
uh, and also it's very easy to spoof caller ID just because a phone phone company said or the telephone says it's internal revenue service or USAA or whoever it's very easy to spoof that that caller ID has no authentication whatsoever so they're getting really good at it and they're getting really good at spoofing phone numbers so it looks like the call is coming from your neighbor uh, you've probably seen that too huh so I mean the important part is that you know you have to be a skeptic in this society when you, you look do. at something it's never face value when you get an email or you get a letter you know like you say throw it in the trash can and go verify with the real site that's one of the big reasons why I use a password manager because when you go to a site that's maybe one letter off from the original site the password manager is not going to fill it out. And so it's really important to use a very skeptical attitude when you're online. Um, hey, the question that I have is, what do, you, what do you think the reason behind all of the hijacking of Facebook, um, Facebook profiles has been? Because I've seen friends over the past six months, maybe four or five have had their profiles hijacked. And I don't understand what the payoff is in that. I, I don't either. I, I don't even go on Facebook anymore. I, they just got fined $5 billion for privacy violations. And I just, I stay away from it. I, I don't see what the payoff is unless they're just trying to do misinformation. They're trying maybe to send, um, um, you know, information about the election or whatever, you know. I suppose they could use it as a bot as a bot thing, but yeah. I mean, we're kind of forced to use Facebook to to show our, our you know, like we were forced to use social media at least to show our, our activities in Rotary. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword. I don't like Facebook, but I, I use it because of the club. Me too. It's about, you know, not only it's about Rotary, it's about my my friends and family in Germany. It's an easier way than to text with everyone every day. And WhatsApp, what I use for you know the private conversation, it's now owned by Facebook as well. So what I did, I made my um, uh, security settings in Facebook very strict. So nobody can find me only with some names or whatever. And uh, what I not like also is you know, if somebody tagging me, I don't accept texts on my pictures when somebody tagging me, I don't accept that because every picture, what you allow um, that they, it's coming up in your chronic or whatever, you cannot delete anymore. So this is why when somebody tag me, I don't allow to, uh, I don't accept that. So my security standards, it's very high. So only friends can, you know, talk with me. Oh, you have my email address, but I don't allow anybody, you know, only to find me over Facebook. Oh, look, Blair is sleeping again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it looks like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> the sad part is that it makes it very difficult for legitimate businesses to do business with yeah. their because everyone has become so afraid of um, picking up the phone and answering a call or yes. um, and I I work for a bank in Canada and um, I was a branch manager and now I'm working as an estate specialist so I I deal with clients uh, who have passed away and the most recent fraud that we had now that I'm in the estate department was uh, there was a couple of fraudsters that went on the Bank of Canada site and was we're looking for um, names of uh, people who hadn't claimed balances. So after nine years, if an account is dormant for nine years uh, at a bank, then the Bank of Canada takes that money and it sits there, and people can search to see if the money went to the Bank of Canada for for uh, possible estate. So there was a call came in to one of my colleagues, and it was a couple of frauds calling in pretending they were the family client that said uh, uh they must be trying all the banks um, the representative could not locate the 
the name of the cold, and while she was on breathing very loud. I'm sorry, Glenda. Somebody's breathing in the microphone, and uh, that comes as a tone, so I cannot hear you. While they're oil pool, it's really loud. Yeah. Uh, she she didn't realize they didn't realize that the uh, my colleague could hear what they were saying when she placed them on hold, and they were talking between themselves about how they were going to trick her. Uh, they were fraudsters. And so that's, you know, that's just an example of how far people go looking for ways to rip off institutions or rip off people when you're looking for dead people and mm -hmm. trying to call a bank and pretend you're the, uh, the heirs of that estate. So you can't trust anybody, unfortunately. Yeah, there is, uh, my niece told me, you know, in Germany, they steal her identity. I don't know where they have all the dates, but then there was ordering something. And then, uh, you know, she get uh, real in trouble because she didn't pay anything for sure. So, and she get really in trouble, but she's working for a lawyer. So uh, the lawyer was stepping in and, you know, helping her. But uh, it's what I what you said, uh, Glenda. I'm also not taking any phone calls when I don't know the number. When it's not in my book, I put. Uh, they can leave me a message, and then I decided I call back or not. Uh, you cannot do that anymore. It's really ridiculous, you know. So, Jim, uh, um, since we're got about 15 minutes left, you want to change topic and talk about this ride you got going on? I do. Oh, by the way, Jim, thank you for um, telling us about this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, Elizabeth, when, when she comes, she'll be talking about fishing. That's what she does for a living. That's where the people are sending the emails, trying to trick you into something or making a call. So what I'm, I'm trying to set up here is a, um, a little event in Johnson City, Tennessee next, I think it's May 29th and 30th. Um, can you see my little hand here? Yeah. Okay, there's Johnson City here. One of the things that, um, and I'm looking for some comments, some feedback, um, whatever you think, but there's a little town called Lenoir, Lenoir here in North Carolina their Rotary Club meets at noon on Friday. So I asked them if they had room for us to visit them that Friday. We could ride down. There's some nice rides here, 321. We could go down there, maybe ride the snake back or something like that. Um, and then we could do a different ride on Saturday. Is that something? How long, how long is that leg, Jim? That leg is 78 miles. Mm -hmm. okay. So. Probably take about three, three and a half hours, leave maybe nine, something like that. So I think it's it's a, a doable a doable thing to try. I haven't heard back from them yet, so. Um, it's, good, it's good riding through there. Lots of twisty roads, very scenic. Love the twisties. <laughs> What's the dates on there, Jim? Um, I think it's May, May 29th and 30th. Of next year, you know, we every May I meet up with some uh, some colleagues out in that area, in the Townsend area, actually, um, and we go on a ride. It'd be interesting if it coincides, but I might be out there anyway. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I didn't tell you, folks, that I got to ride with uh, some IFMR folks over in France on this recent business trip, did I? I know I mentioned it to. Um, yeah, I got that. The Jerry and Linda, yeah, yeah. It's a good time. Can well, you see the, on the oh, Autobahn, and we got rained on all day. Scott's being mild about it, but he rode with the international president of IFMR. He's a really cool guy, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's been pretty cool. Was that a, a planned a event, Scott? It was, and Jerry gave me the hookup because I happened to be over in Germany on business. And so, um, you know, I just, we, we checked in with them. Did you have anything going on in the area? And, uh, and sure enough, they did. And it's kind of a long haul for me from Darmstadt, but well worth it. I know that. 
<laughs> yeah, it was fun. Yeah, Odenwald. You was going through the Odenwald, right? Um, Odenwald was the first weekend. The ah, second ah, weekend was Vosges, Vosges region of France near Saarbrücken. Yeah. And then the third weekend, I was uh, motorcycling with a former colleague in Japan. He lives there, and we went in the, the Mito to Nico area and got to see um, uh, uh, the, the Honda Museum mm -hmm. at uh, Ed Motegi. Great. And some other stuff, and stayed in this onsen kind of lodge near a lake. It's a really town place, and there was a nice set of switchbacks. Okay. So it was a good time. Yeah. I can so, imagine. Can you see the, the Rotary Club there? Bicycles. You see bicycles. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is the hotel. Um, John's. John's went so well that um, the Fairfield suites are nice. Um, if if we if we book 15 rooms, we can get $106 a night. If we don't get 15, then it's 144 a night. It's a pretty nice hotel. They have a, a good breakfast. Um, right across the street is a place called Aubrey's a restaurant. Um, there's also a Ming's Asian restaurant, and there's a room back here that we could get as a private room if we wanted. If we wanted to have a, a private dinner one night. Nice. Um, another thing is Bristol Motor Speedway is about, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles away. So we could arrange a tour if you wanted to do something like that. I think some of the guys said last time that um, they were able to go on the track. When I was there, we could only go on the track. About two years ago, their insurance company quit letting them do that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, they let the, the guy took us out in a van, but they were doing some work, so we could only go up part way on the track. But they, they do let, they do take you out in a van and they'll take you into the owner's suite and some things like oh, that. Oh, it was, the owner's suite is fabulous. Yeah, it was very nice. But that's an interesting place to go. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that and see if anybody had any thoughts or ideas. Well, about four miles away for lunch, there's an amazing little hole-in-the-wall barbecue place. Now we're talking. You're always thinking on eating, you know. It's, always... it's not a bad thought. <laughs> ride to eat. Eat to ride. Like great trip, <laughs> Jim. Hot <laughs> meats. Like, who's it... screwing up my rotary? Come on now. Does it, does it look like I'm heading in the right direction with this thing? Or? It looks like a great ride. Yeah, it looks like a great ride, Jim. What were the dates again you were thinking about? Um, well, I was going to travel on the um, probably the 28th. So there'd be two days of rides. If somebody wanted to show up early on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, they could come along on the pre-ride. What date? It's heard it three times. I 29th and 30th of May. <laughs> Maybe you need to email it to us. Oh yeah, that, you'll you'll see it. Uh, I'm just I'm just okay. I'm heading in the right direction. Yeah, if you'll put my employer like Ute did when she started the ride, put together some information. Oh, I will. Yeah, we'll start getting it into the flyer and uh, and and just uh, promote it the same way. Yeah, it's got to go out on uh, IFMR too. We got quite an echo going again. You should mute your line if you're not talking, please. I made it a little bit more. You know, I made it a little bit more lies. It's not that loud, and that's that helps a lot. And by the way, um, there was one guy from our district. He tried to book a room for our rally in the in Texas in Bandera, and then he told my husband very quickly, and he said, "Oh, I cannot find a room. I cannot find a room." So, guys, when you want a room, tell me, please. We can make the connections to the to the ranch because we blocked rooms. So of course they cannot tell it's free if you don't know. Uh, you have to say IFMR, then it's open, and then they will give you a room. So, but we have we have so you can still book or tell me if you want to participate. No problem. 
the the one with my colleagues there is May 13 to 16. I found out so a little bit earlier. It'd be hard to get two trips into Tennessee from California when that close together. I think. Okay, ours is in end of March, 27 to 29th. Yeah. Texas. All right. <laughs> then there's another one up on River Road, I think, in um, what, July, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's good. If we're going in the cooler direction in July, that's fine for us, you know. Well, it is a little cooler up there. It can get hot up there, too. That's yeah. right. March. It'll, um, it'll be a nice ride. That's if those of you that went on the ride that I did in Iowa, uh, here a couple of years ago, it's it starts basically where we left off going north, and Jim's going to take us north, and it's it's beautiful all through there, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it looks like there's some buzz. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't uh, start talking about it. Mm. Our, our Ute's ride has been uh, successful to bring people and get interest. So, hey, let's uh, keep the keep the momentum going. Oh, there was uh, somebody asking about uh, my polio ride I make every year. So um, it's not a problem to share all you know what I did. I made a flyer. I made you know, a sponsor form for everybody. So it's not a big thing for me to share that with you. Maybe we can make something like a, um, an event, you know, and, and, and um, over cuffing, uh, um, what, how can you say, over the whole country, you know, making somebody make it in, in each area, that would be great as well. So if somebody is interesting, I have no problem to share that all information with you guys, you know, because it's, you know, it's it, it's about fun. It's about riding in the district and 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 make it. My motto is always: I try to make it as easy as possible because if it's too complicated. Nobody will, you know, will do it. The mm. people want to to have the fun, and mm. maybe a nice lunch. They don't have to pay for. This is what I'm looking always for that I have a sponsor for the lunch. And they get a T-shirt for the ride, a special T-shirt for the polio ride. Um, we we made some over the days, but it's only for three or four hours. You know, it's really easy going, and only have fun and be together and have a social time together. And that is at the end what the money brings. So, but if well, there's it's another interesting, no problem. Ask me. I can send you all the stuff over. There was another case of polio now in the Philippines, huh? Yes. But it was, that was a vaccine um, related, actually it was a live vaccine caused. Hmm. Was that another one in India again? That was yeah, also right? a live vaccine, I think. I yeah. mean, these live vaccines have been going on for some time. Once in a while, they get caught up into an actual outbreak of the live vaccine uh, spread of the virus. That happened in, uh, Oh, somewhere in Africa, oh, three years ago, they ended up with 40 or 50 cases all at once. And they had to go in and do another mass uh, uh, mass vaccination, but it's vaccine derived. And so until we're done, that sort of thing's still gonna happen. Well, we could go to a killed vaccine. The problem is, is that it has to be a series. And so it can't just be a one-off a one thing. The live vaccine is, a much better um, coverage. I don't know what the question was now. I don't either. <laughs> but it's uh, 759. So is there anything else anybody has to say for the good of Rotary? Oh, um, I was going to throw this out there. This Friday in the Bay I just wanna, Area. I want to thank Jim again for a great program. Uh, the, the Women Riders World Relay is making its rounds in the U.S. now. And so if they come through your area, you might want to see where they're at locally. 
they're having a party out here on Treasure Island. Um, I'll be there Friday night, but uh, see when they're passing through. It's uh, womenwritersworldrelay.org or something like that. Pretty easy to find. Where are you lo located, Scott? Um, I'm in Alameda, in East Bay, near Oakland. So just right across the bay from San Francisco. Oh, okay. But this is an international women's motorcycle ride. It's a relay. And wow. um, I think the whole thing is like a year or something long. Mm -hmm. uh, fantastic thing to see. Mm -hmm. So if it's coming, if it's coming near your town, you might want to see where they're at. Um, see if you want to ride a leg with them. I think if you're actually going on the ride with them, it's for women only, which is cool. But um, places they're stopping and have a little party, you know, give them some moral support. Do, do you have some information you can put on the newsletter, maybe? If you, oh, yeah. if you send yeah, I can me send a link, Scott, or something like that, then um, if you send me a link, I can get it into I know room. we've got we've got two or three ladies from our group that are planning on riding a portion of it. See? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, the, the thing was kind of organized out of Santa Cruz, California, not too far from where I'm, where I'm at. And it's a podcast I once in a while join in down in Santa Cruz. And... Um, so those folks are in on it. I'm getting a link right now. If I can. There we go. So guys, think about it. Keep me in prayer next week, Wednesday at the morning for my test. You know what I'm talking about. Yay, you're going to do great. Uh, uh, we will see. You're going to come back morning. with your, your American flag badge on. <laughs>